That's what I want to talk about, the hope of salvation. Advent's four weeks long. It has four themes. Heather mentioned this earlier. Today is hope. Next week is peace. Two weeks from now is love. And Katie's going to unpack and help us think through the advent, the coming. Advent means coming. The coming of love, God's love, into the world. And then the last Sunday is joy, joy to the world. So today we'll think about hope. True hope is realistic. False hope is blind optimism. A United Church minister friend of mine who lives in Halifax writes a blog, and this fall has been tough for him. I won't get into all the details of him, his life, health, church, but this fall has been tough for him. Listen, reading from his blog, rising early on November 11th, I am allowing a clear, dark truth to fall upon me. There is no place for glittery optimism in this life. November 11th. So he next says, wars will continue. Plato was right, only the dead have seen the end of war. Sunny, shiny surface optimism, the kind that requires the turning of eyes away from life's shadows. Sunny, shiny surface optimism must go. It must be replaced by hope. And hope is darker. It rises from the shadows and mines them for gold. Hope is more honest. Its agents know that they will not see its project to completion. Hope knows it may not see the project to completion. They know that should they be brave, should they risk the wilderness, Like Moses, they may get a glimpse of the promised land, but they will never enter. Not on this side of Jesus' return, anyway. And yet, and here's where he ended in his blog, and yet I find myself rising from this autumn's traumas, able to breathe more freely. It seems that my dreams of late have been too compromising. I was too willing to settle for a little peace, to linger in a comfortable lazy boy, to wall off little bits of a world without crucifixions. He built his nice little happy place. And these lies were encrusting my organs and constricting breath Tragic wars, shocking elections, natural disasters have been a kick in the guts that seems to have cleared the false hopes from my system, at least for a time. I know I have to turn to face the shadows, but strangely, I can breathe better now as I do. Blind optimism is also false hope. That's what he's saying. That's what I'm saying. Blind optimism is false hope. It's a mistake to trust only ourselves and rely on ourselves, we humans, and say to ourselves, it's getting better, we can do this, it's up to us. Now, I wouldn't ever eliminate the necessity and the challenge that we're in this together and we need to work together as humanity. But the message of Christmas goes directly against the shallow thinking that says it's all up to us. It's not left up to us. That's why we're here. 
That's what Advent is about. A person said to me recently, I'll tell you why I go to church. I go to church to be reminded of what I need to do to live a better life, to find out where I've gone wrong and what I need to do to get it right. Then I hope to get motivated to lead a better life. Ouch. Really? Ouch. Friends, if that's all church is, a pep rally to get you fired up to do what needs to be done, then that kind of church would get oppressive and and lay guilt and weight on us. The church, that kind of church is, is worshiping an inactive little God who leaves us to our own devices and say, it's all up to you guys. Shape up. And then church becomes a shopping list of what we ought to do rather than being a proclamation of what God has already done and is doing again and again in Jesus. If we go with the other thinking, the church is where you get your to-do list, You come to church, you get your assignment for the week. This week, I want you folks to work on your stinginess, your hidden racism toward First Nations and immigrants. I can't even look at you as I'm saying this. Your rudeness to sales clerks and telemarketers. We're not even going there. Come back next week, we'll work on the rest of your sins, but start there for now. If that's what I I and the church lays on you, no wonder you leave church feeling more weary than when you arrive. No wonder there isn't much hope. If it's mostly left up to us, then what real hope have we when the chips are down? When we look at today's three scriptures that I read, the two with the kids and then the last one, you see this pretty clearly, that it's not all left up to us. Firstly, the prophecy of John the Baptist's father, saying, You, child, will go before the Lord to prepare and give knowledge of salvation for the forgiveness of sins. And then Jesus' own earthly father, Joseph, hearing the angel say to him, You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And finally, Thirty-some years later, Jesus' own encounter with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who changes his directory because Jesus came to him. Jesus said to him, I am coming to your house. I must come to your house this day. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Do you see what they're saying? Today's scriptures... They declare our ultimate hope is not all on us. It comes from beyond us, from outside our desperate efforts. We're not in this alone, thank God. Those whose lives are shipwrecked understand this. In 1943, after being arrested by the Nazis, Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer sat in a prison during a cold, dark, lonely advent, and he wrote a letter to a friend. And Bonhoeffer, in his letter, compared his situation in that Nazi prison in Germany. He compared his situation there to our situation as Christians in Advent. One waits, hopes, does this, that, or the other, things that really are of no consequence. The door is shut and can be opened only from the outside. Bonhoeffer understood, locked in his prison. A door that can only be opened from the outside. Freedom, release that must come from beyond. Some of you read the... uh, Bible version, The Message. Eugene Peterson wrote it. And Peterson says, the root meaning in Hebrew of salvation 
He will save his people. The root meaning in Hebrew of salvation is to be broad, to become spacious, to enlarge. It carries the sense of deliverance from an existence that has become compressed, confined, cramped. That's Bonhoeffer in his Nazi prison cell, locked in. God wants to set us free, to make it possible for us to live open and loving lives with God and our neighbors. Here's a God who comes to open our locked prison doors behind which we fret and worry. Okay, I gave you that image of locked in a prison, stole it from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Let me give you another one, another way to think about Christmas and Christ's coming. Another picture of this truth of God's intervening, diving into the world's activity. Think of a diver. Maybe even shut your eyes and picture one of those cliff divers. First, peeling off robes, and then glancing up and, in, and going in midair and gone with a splash. Vanished, rushing down through green warm water into black cold water, down, down through increasing pressure. Are you seeing it? Into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay at the bottom. And then up again, back to color and light, lungs almost bursting till suddenly he breaks surface again, holding in his hand the dripping, precious thing that he went down to recover. In the Christian story, God comes down, down from the heights of absolute being in time and space, down into humanity. But he goes down to come up again and bring the whole ruined world up with him. That's the Christmas story. That's the Christian story. The hope of salvation. When people think, a lot of us, when we think of spiritual salvation, we often have a very narrow concept of it. We think salvation is being saved from hell. But God has so much more in mind than just fire insurance. When coming in Jesus to be our Savior, God's gift of true salvation is freedom, purpose, life to the fullest. We're not only saved from something bad, we are saved for something good. The first Christ followers understood this very quickly. That I'm reading a verse that I use a lot, probably four or five times a year. Ephesians chapter 2. Just, I'll just read you verse 10. In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works, which God planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. We're not only saved from something, we're saved for something very good. It's likely you haven't given much thought to your need for a savior or what you need to be saved from. In one survey of Christmas shoppers, they were asked, what do you need to be saved from? Guy with a mic in a mall, and he talked to passers-by, and he said, what do you need to be saved from? Here's what the answers varied widely from worry, from the cost of gas and my debt, from the people who've hurt me, from my anger, from my past, I can't seem to let it go, from my bad habits, from myself. Some of those are quite telling, don't you think? A dose of realism a hint of desperation. We can't save ourselves. There's a, there's a depiction of Christmas 
of the story of the babe in a manger, I've talked about several images, uh, the diver, the prison cell. Let me just give you one more as we're starting into the Advent season. And this is, this is about being shipwrecked at the stable. I used the phrase a few moments ago. The story of the babe in the manger is about our yearning approach to this Savior using the idea of shipwrecked lives and a shipwrecked world coming to the stable. Listen. This is from Spanish author Jose Ortega. The man with the clear head is the man who frees himself from fantasy and looks life in the face, realizes that everything in it is problematic and feels himself lost. And this is the simple truth, that to live is to feel oneself lost, sometimes. Whoever accepts this has already begun to find himself to be on firm ground, instinctively, as do the shipwrecked. He will look around for something to which to cling because it is a question of his salvation. I love that. I love that because the shipwrecked at the stable are people like us, the poor in spirit who sometimes feel lost in this vast cosmos, adrift on an open sea, clinging with a life and death desperation to the one solitary plank. And then finally, washed ashore and making our way to the stable, stripped of any old spirit of cockiness or overconfidence or possessiveness in regard to anything. We've been saved, rescued, delivered from the waters of death, set free for a new shot a new chance at life. And at the stable, in a blinding moment of truth, making the stunning discovery that Jesus is the plank of salvation that we've been clinging to without knowing it. All the time battered by wind and rain, buffeted by life's raging sea, but being held even when we didn't know who was holding us. Welcome to Advent. Christ has come. Christ is coming. Thanks be to God. Amen.